All right, everyone. Uh, this is Tim Vixay with my crippled friend. This is episode number 25. And uh, for this week, we're just going to do something a little different. Um, I wasn't able to get a guest just because uh, kind of in between trips and just been kind of extremely busy. And uh, if you, um, you know, follow the podcast on YouTube, you'd realize that I'm very behind. Um, and I apologize for that. I'm going to do a lot of catching up. Um, it's just right now for the next foreseeable future, I'm going to be kind of busy. Um, got a lot of trips planned, got a lot of things going on, but I'm um, going to continue to um, try to release an episode at least once a week, um, whether I have to, you know, record a bunch and then bank him and then uh, release him a little bit at a time. But um, so for this week, uh, what I wanted to do was um, I solicited some questions on uh, social media and we're just going to do a like kind of a quick little Q&A. So this might be a short or a shorter uh, episode than usual. Um, depends how long I'm going to get through these questions. Uh, we are um, going to cover kind of a variety of topics and the people, uh, all the fans on social media kind of shot out um, a variety of questions. And so what I did was um, kind of organize them so that way it kind of flows all together. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Uh, the first set of questions were kind of pertaining to um, accessibility or I guess wheelchair life, crippled life. So the first question I got is, what do you think should happen to assholes who park in ADA spots unauthorized? Um, well, I guess, I mean, the number one thing is um, there's fines and penalties that are already in place. So I think um, we can do a better job of um, enforcing those fines. Um, it doesn't have to be like completely, you know, too hefty. Um, I think, uh, I forget what it is in Oregon, but it's like 200 bucks. Um, I think on top of that, um, what we can do is we can um, force those individuals, I guess force would be a bad word. We can, um, we can uh, require those individuals to do kind of a community service. And I like to see that done at, you know, an adaptive sporting event, um, such as a wheelchair rugby tournament, you know, volunteering at a wheelchair rugby tournament, um, or going and volunteering at like the Special Olympics. That way they kind of get the, um, the awareness and they can kind of see why individuals need those spots. Um, you know, me personally, I drive a um, pickup truck and I, you know, require kind of an ad additional space um, on my driver's side to get in and out. Um, it's not necessarily that I want to park up close, uh, although that is kind of nice. I will gladly take a spot further away, you know, from the front door of a grocery store if I can just, um, as long as I, I can get in and out of my vehicle. And I know, you know, a lot of my friends drive those uh, side loading ramp vans, and those require, let's say, about like eight to 10 feet of additional clearance. And it's not necessarily like that they just want to park closer to the store. It's just that those um, those spaces, the the striped blue lines that are in between the parking spots that are actually marked off, um, th those are for getting in and out of the vehicle. Um, and I have seen um, people that just completely disregard those striped lanes. And I think that's a bigger issue than just someone who, you know, obviously just doesn't give a fuck and just parks in, um, a marked, in a marked handicap spot. But, you know, if you're, uh, if you're one of those people that park in the stripe lanes, you are definitely a piece of shit. Uh, second question is, uh, if I wanted to start a consulting firm to go through building slash plans slash to help builders, Think about usability for all. What advice would you give me to get started? Um, that one's kind of tough. I think um, 
I think disabilities kind of range, so I can only really speak for um, my, my disability. Um, you know, I use a, a wheelchair to get around. Um, and I guess some of the biggest issues that I have when it comes to accessibilities within a building would be, um, I guess the number one thing would be uh, on, on doors, uh, knobs, are definitely no go. Um, I I prefer handles over just the traditional door knob. Uh, there was a there was a time recently um, when I was out in Denver. We went to um, we went to go see a show, and the accessible bathroom had a door knob, and then on top of that, the door was also kind of hard to shut which meant it was kind of hard to open and then so i mean with my hands i got no no use of my fingers so i'm trying to double fist this door open so by the time i can get the door latched and i'm trying to pull it's just not going to work i was actually stuck in this bathroom for about five minutes trying to yank on this door open while simultaneously using two hands to turn the knob uh, where if I just had a door handle, I would have been able to get the leverage I needed. Um, I guess another issue that I have with um, most uh, buildings is uh, wider bathroom stalls. Um, you know, sometimes there's, or most of the time I'd say there's, there'll be one um, handicapped bathroom stall with uh, a wide door and it's usually taken um, where I run into this issue a lot is at the airport. And I believe that's because there's a lot of travelers that are kind of traveling with all their, you know, carry on luggage and they just feel like, uh, it's, you know, easier for them to just bring it into the handicap stall. Um, me, I personally don't really care for the, all that extra room in that wide stall. It's just, I can, I, I, sh if possible, like I, I would just use a regular stall, but I, oh, my chair's just about like an inch or two wide. So, um, you know, if you just widen the, the, just the regular bathroom stall, um, I'd be able to get in, do my thing and get right out. And, um, I guess the, uh, the last thing would just be, uh, roll under sinks in the bathroom. Uh, most places do a good job of having a place where we can roll under, wash our hands. Um, but I have seen some places where that's not, um, that, that, that they, they, don't, they don't really do that. Uh, the next question is, what is the challenge a wheelchair user faces that an able-bodied person wouldn't normally think of? And, um, you know, this is, uh, one of those issues that, um, not issues. This is one of those things that I didn't really think about until I, uh, became paralyzed myself. But, you know, when you see someone in a wheelchair, you think, all right, they're, uh, they're just using their arms to get around. Um, but what you don't think about is all the other stuff that is paralyzed, you know, on top of their body. And what I mean by that are the bowel and bladder issues that, um, most people with a spinal cord injury have to deal with. Um, without getting into too much of a detail, I don't have control of my bowel or bladders. So I use a, uh, intermittent catheter to piss and I use a, um, magic bullet suppository to take a shit. And then, um, I was also thinking about this question and, um, another thing that we, um, we cripples kind of face that a able body person doesn't think about is, um, you know, when you're going to a, like an event, say like a concert or a comedy show or like, you know, a theatrical play, um, is purchasing accessible tickets. Um, sometimes you, um, you, you got to go through Ticketmaster, and, and I've noticed that they've been getting better about it, but, um, 
you know, but like when I want to go to like, say like a blazer game, I got to go to Ticketmaster. Then I got to specify that, Hey, I need a, um, ADA seat. Um, so that way I'm not, you know, having to walk up and down steps and, and then, um, a lot of times those, uh, those tickets are kind of limited. So a, um, a big, uh, A big um, barrier would be just trying to find, you know, accessible um, tickets to those those events. Um, I know there was um, when I was living in Las Vegas, I wanted to go see a George Strait concert. And what had happened was, I mean, those tickets are going to be in high demand. And what happened was um, as soon as the tickets went on sale the um all the uh all the ADA seats were sold out almost immediately and you know what i ended up having to do was i went on to StubHub and i found those seats and they were marked up by shit probably about 400% you know they were they were four times what um ticketmaster was asking and um Ah, fucking me being the big George Strait fan that I am, I I still wanted to um, go see it. So I just kind of had to bite the bullet and and buy those seats. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like if, um, if Ticketmaster really wanted to do something about that, what they should do is um, kind of go through like a ver- verification process where you, I don't know, either submit um, a letter from your doctor and get kind of verified through them and then that way you're um you know that the people that are buying those those tickets are um those individuals that you know need those seats uh let's see next question is uh what is a tip for flying uh sorry what is a tip for flying you would have for someone who uses a wheelchair and hasn't flown before? Um, and that's kind of a, that's a question I get a lot, uh, especially from the rugby side of the house when we, um, we have like a, a newly injured person who is um, trying to fly and hasn't flown before. And, you know, typically one of their biggest concerns is, um, how do I use a bathroom on a plane? And I'll tell you what I do is I always make sure I bring either, um, a hoodie or a blanket and a lot of empty bottles. And by a lot, I mean, what I kind of predict is going to be necessary for the next, um, or, you know, for however long the duration of the flight is. Um, so typically I will have my, um, small little camel back backpack that I use to keep my, um, my catheters and all my supplies in on top of like, you know, my, um, headphones and anything else I'd rather need, you know, like some snacks or some like peanut M&Ms or whatever. Um, and then I make sure I bring, I'd say minimum like two empty bottles. If it's going to be a longer flight, I try to stuff as many as I can in there. And, um, I always, um, I always try to get a window seat if I can, um, unless I'm traveling with, you know, some like friends or some teammates where privacy isn't really an issue, but, um, I guess we'll just get into kind of how I, um, how I take a piss on a flight. So if I'm on a window seat, um, typically what I'll do is, uh, I will use the blanket or sweater and I will stuff, you know, the corner of the blanket or the sleeve of a sweater into the um, little folding tray, the food tray, and uh, do what I call, you know, pitch in the tent where I kind of create like a little, you know, barrier or a curtain um, in between me and whoever, um, is sitting next to me. Oh, another thing, <laughs> I guess, uh, if, if the person next to me, if I don't, n- if I don't know them, I usually, uh, try to, you know, explain the situation, um, beforehand. Uh, you typically when they sit down, I'll, 
I'll warn him. I'll say, Hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm paralyzed. Um, and at some point on this flight, I may need to take a piss. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to be as discreet as I can, but I don't want you to freak out. Um, so yeah, like if, um, what I'll do is, you know, I'll, I'll pitch my tent up and then I'll just grab, grab what I need and, um, go do my thing. And, um, try to, uh, try to pack out, you know, everything that I, that I've had. So I'm not going to leave, you know, an, an empty, or I'm not going to leave a, you know, bottle of piss on the, on the floor for, you know, the, uh, the cleaning crew to clean up. I'll just, you know, pack all that out with me. And when I can, I'll get to the nearest restroom and, and dump it all out and, you know, typically try to reuse those bottles, um, wash them out and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's my number one tip for flying. Uh, next question. What is the most accessible country you have been to? Uh, that's an easy one and it's kind of an obvious one. Um, United States of America is definitely the most accessible country that I have ever been to. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, our ADA laws and, kind of just the awareness that we have um but yeah getting outside of kind of the obvious uh Canada and Australia is pretty good um and then I guess I don't know, a little bonus answer for that would be a surprisingly accessible country and I would say Singapore uh they um they kind of blew me away as far as accessibility um I've been to I don't know, half a dozen Asian countries and even some of the modern ones like uh, Korea and Japan weren't really accessible. I mean, they were wheelchair friendly enough where you can get around. And then I've been to, you know, some Southeast Asian countries where it was just completely inaccessible. But Singapore kind of blew me away. They, um, they really had their shit together uh, when it came to uh, wheelchair friendliness. Um, and I don't think there was really any big issues. Um, there, there might've been like a couple steps. Um, but as far as like curb cuts and bathrooms, like everything was, um, everything was actually really, uh, really friendly there. Um, as far as, uh, a wheelchair user goes. Next question. Uh, if you could travel anywhere you've already been based on what place has the best food, where would you go? And uh, I'm going to go back to uh, Singapore on this one. And I think it's just because their food culture is just kind of amazing. They um, they take really big like pride in, in their food scene. Um, it's kind of a, I'd say a little bit of a melting pot as far as uh and an asian culture is gonna go um there's uh what do they call them ha they're called hawker centers which i guess can be kind of best described as like uh like a food court ish i guess i don't know i guess it's kind of like if you've ever been in like portland it's kind of like a food cart cart pod where they're just small little stores. It's kind of just a food court. But some of their hawker centers, like some of the restaurants at the hawker centers, um, actually have uh, Michelin um, ratings or stars or however that that system works. But, um, yeah, the, the food in Singapore is just really good. Um, if you can't afford to go to Singapore, or you don't have a reason to go to Singapore, or you don't want to get out of the country, I'd say the food in New Orleans is maybe the most unique and culturally different. Um, but yeah, New Orleans, they, uh, they take really good pride in their food as well. And, um, if, uh, if I ever, uh, if I ever decide to like eat myself to death, I think I'm going to go to New Orleans for about a week and just uh eat all the uh all the jambalaya and all the um all the cajun food uh, that i can possibly stuff into my face next question um have you ever wanted to 
<coughs> excuse me. Have you ever wanted to travel somewhere but haven't gone yet due to accessibility of that location? Uh, yeah. Um, I think ever since I was little and I found out what Mount Everest was, I wanted to go to the top of Mount Everest. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know if that's in the, the cards for me anymore, but um, I'd be open for an expedition. I don't think I want to be the first uh, quadriplegic to attempt that, but um, if someone ever successfully does it and shows me that it's possible, yeah, I'd be, uh, I'd be willing to give it a shot. So um, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're an expert climber and you think it's possible, uh, maybe uh, reach out to me. Next question, um, what places are on your bucket list for, uh, sorry, can't fucking read. Uh, what places are on your bucket list for next year for traveling? I um, think we talked about, um, I just got back from Bonaire like two weeks ago and we, um, we talked about going to, um, Shook Lagoon or Truck Lagoon or Chuck Lagoon. There's a couple of different names for it, but that is a, um, small little island in the, um, Federated States of Micronesia, I believe it's called. It's, uh, it's in the South Pacific, but basically what it is, is it was the uh, main naval base for um, the Japanese during, during World War II. And um, what had happened was um, one day the, uh, the U.S. Navy kind of went in there and, and bombed the fuck out of them and left a um left a pretty significant amount of um shipwrecks and different things that you can kind of see underwater so on my bucket list for next year uh there there was talks about um possibly going there and doing um doing a lot of uh wreck diving um and I know if, uh, if I were to do that, just because I was, I was looking at flights and it's about, uh, five or six leg, um, kind of travel. And it's like, I don't know, 25, 30 hours. Um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, almost probably it's a, like a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Um, I think I would like to get, um, rebreather certified for, uh, scuba diving um that way i can um i can stay under and um and see as much of it as i possibly can um so uh so hopefully that that kind of happens but uh we'll see we'll keep you posted on that all right um the next set of questions are going to kind of relate to wheelchair rugby and adaptive sports and so the first question we have about that is what was the most challenging aspect about getting started in wheelchair rugby? And I'd say for me personally, the, um, the biggest thing and why I didn't get into wheelchair rugby right away was, um, kind of a comfort zone thing. Um, I came home from, uh, I got injured in San Diego and I came home in, oh, I got, okay, back it up. I got injured in San Diego in July. And I came home to uh, Portland, Oregon, or you know, outside of Portland, Oregon, um, in November. And I didn't get into wheelchair rugby, or I didn't go and even, you know, get involved or go see wheelchair rugby until um february when portland the team in portland the portland pounders they had their um annual tournament in february and um i um i don't even think i had plans to go to it but i was kind of encouraged um or voluntold as we would say it to go to go check it out and so I went to go see it. Um, 
uh, my I kind of kept to myself, just was kind of figuring out the game. Um, but my folks were talking with um, Gordy Johnson, who's uh, the father of uh, Kip Johnson. I've had him on the on the podcast in the past, and um, Kip Kip and I kind of have a similar injury, and um, you know my uh, my stepdad and Gordy were talking. And then so afterwards on the drive back home, um, my stepdad, Pat, was telling me, uh, hey, you know, I was talking with Gordy and, you know, um, his son has a similar injury and he's uh, he doesn't use a, uh, a power chair. Oh, yeah, I guess I should mention at the time I was still um, I was still using my power chair. I mean, full blown power chair. Um, and you know, I had I had a um, what's called a power assist, which is a a manual chair with um, power assist wheels, um, so it's not quite a full blown power chair. And um, I um, want to say after that, I I went to the next uh, practice with the Pounders. Um, I think I want to say I showed up in my power chair, but that might've been the last time I ever got into it because, um, once I got, once I got in the rugby chair and was kind of, I mean, a, a rugby chair and like a regular everyday chair is a lot different, um, as far as propulsion and, and your seating position, it just allows you to use, more of your muscles, more effective use of your muscles. So, um, once I, um, once I got kind of bit by the rugby bug and, you know, I, uh, I ditched that power chair and, and started using my, um, my power assist and then, uh, was using that power assist for, I'd say maybe about two years. And then I, ditched the, uh, the power wheels and went straight to a, um, just a traditional, you know, manual self-propelled chair. Um, but yeah, going back to the question, it was, um, I think it was more of a comfort, comfort thing for me. Um, you know, at the time it was like dealing with the injury, dealing with the new body, trying to figure shit out. What am I going to do? Um, but I would really, really encourage, excuse me um i would really encourage um anyone who is freshly injured is to just um not uh yeah i mean yeah you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get uncomfortable you're gonna have to step out of that comfort zone expand that comfort zone however you want to phrase it and um and and get involved um if um if it's anything, you know, if, if, if your local sports, adaptive sports teams, anything like the Pounders were, they're going to be more than welcoming. They're going to be, um, there's going to be plenty of guys there that are, that are going to be great role models, great mentors, and guys that are um, just going to be able to kind of help you, you know, guide you, guide you through your, um, your first few years of the injury. Excuse me one second, I'm going to take a sip of water. Um, I think <clears throat> I'm also going to address that question a little bit further. And I think, um, some of the other challenges for getting started in wheelchair rugby would be, um, like location. You know, if you live in the middle of nowhere where there is no rugby team and you got to drive three, four hours to go to practice, um, that, that can certainly present a challenge. And I know there's um, there's there's guys that play rugby that have to do it. Um, personally, I know guys that drive two two and a half hours just to get to practice. You know, and that's on a once a week, twice a week basis. Um, so location can um, certainly be a uh, a challenge. Um, I think maybe one of the biggest ones would be uh, getting equipment. Um, and I've, uh, I've said this time and time again, um, being a service connected, um, veteran, um, 
I have access to uh, um, th- that equipment. You know, the uh, the VA provides that equipment for me. Um, so I'm, I'm able to get, um, you know, my, my rugby wheelchair, um, and, and those things aren't cheap. Um, they range from, I'm brand new. I mean, you're talking anywhere from four G's up and it's not, it's not cheap, you know, for, for equipment. And then you're looking at tubes and tires and, uh, replacing your wheels talking like gloves and tape like none of that none of that, all, all that shit adds up so equipment is definitely a, another barrier and then i'd say another one would be like time um i'd say most rugby teams practice once a week some twice a week and uh the elite ones they're uh they're getting after it probably three times a week um and uh you know if you're uh if you're a working quad, um, that doesn't really leave you um, a whole lot of time because you got your 40-hour work week, and then you got your um, you got your um, other routines, and and then you got your you know you got to take care of your family, you got your family life, and and those things to address. So, I think time is a uh, time's another another barrier for sure. All right, um, let's see. Next question. Would you ever consider coaching slash mentoring young athletes for wheelchair rugby? Uh, simple answer. Absolutely. Um, we uh trying to think if Portland. Yeah. Uh, Portland's Portland's had some some younger um, some younger athletes. And um, and then also on um, on the other side of the house. I mean, outside of the, the Portland team. Um, we, uh, we have, it was called the Oregon, Oregon disabled sports. I think they, they've changed their name. Now it's, a adaptive sports Northwest, but they had a, um, they kind of had a program where it was like, uh, it was, it was more of like an introductory program where, uh, it was, I think it was once a month. It was like the last Wednesday or the last Thursday a month where we would, you know, uh, invite, um, newly injured or, or, um, or, uh, like the youth to come out and, and try different sports. And that was, um, that was something that I, that I always liked volunteering for. Cause one, I was able to get in my rugby chair and get some gym time, which, you know, is always a good thing. But then it was also, um, being able to help other uh, people, especially newly injured and, um, the young athletes, um, especially the young athletes, just because they're, um, the, you know, like me growing up, I, I always growing up able body. I, I had a variety of different competitive venues, um, and different things that I can use to kind of get that competitiveness out of me. Uh, but for, you know, young, young athletes, it's, um, it's a little bit limited and they don't necessarily know what, what's out there for them. So I think, um, it absolutely is important to kind of be a mentor, um, and be a role model to show the younger athletes, um, you know, what's possible and to give them positive role models. Um, I'd say one of the biggest examples of that is, um, at the uh, National Veteran Wheelchair Games, we have a uh, an event there called Kids Day, where we invite um, local disabled kids to come out and try some of the events. And I mean, we're talking kids that are anywhere from two years old, three years old to um, teenagers, uh, but they're coming out and they're you know they're competing, and we you know we we run them through couple different things we we shoot hoops with them or we run them through uh you know the um kind of a modified obstacle course um but i think it's important like you know just to just for them to hang out with people that are older um and also in wheelchairs because um who knows them you know when they're when they're in school they're they're kind of hanging out 
with their own their own peers and they don't necessarily have anyone in a wheelchair to look up to um and i i certainly think it's important to um to to be those role models to be to be that positive role model to just show them that hey like um life goes on sort of thing so all right, that's all I got about that. Uh, next question. What sports... Uh, actually, the next question I got asked kind of twice in a roundabout way. So I'll just... Um, I'll read off both questions and then kind of answer them in conjunction with each other. Uh, what sports haven't you tried yet that you want to try? Is there an adaptive sport you haven't tried yet that you would like to? Uh, the biggest thing that I haven't tried yet that I really want to is, um, bungee jumping. I, um, I never got to do that as an able body. Um, and I certainly know that it's possible in a wheelchair. It's just that I haven't had that kind of presented to me yet. Um, but, um, I know there's a place, I believe it's in Whistler, Canada, um, they'll, uh, they'll jump cripples. And then I was just, uh, I was just talking with another buddy when we were hunting this past week and he was telling me there might be a place in central or Southern Oregon or maybe Northern California that'll, um, that'll bungee jump cripples. And that's, uh, that's certainly something that I would be up for trying, um, Although I don't really consider that a sport because I think any Joe Schmo off the couch can just go on the internet, sign up, and go do it. So I consider that more of an activity. So to um, kind of canvas the uh, the question even more, I think the next sport that I'm going to really get into um, this next year is going to be hand cycling. I'm looking to get a... Um, I guess you would call it an off-road hand cycle. And uh, just want to kind of log more miles on the cranks. Um, I do have a hand cycle. You know, when I when I first got injured, I, um, I got one. Um, and it, it's 100% more of like a recreational bike. It's what I believe they call it um, an upright versus a recumbent. Basically, the biggest difference there is uh, how your legs are positioned. Uh, with an upright bike, it's essentially just me sitting there with my legs, um, how I would normally have them if I were like in my everyday chair. And a recumbent is your legs are out in front of you and you're sitting a little bit lower and they're designed more for racing. And it's not necessarily that I want to get into like the the competitive racing side of things. I just want to get into hand cycling, um, and I'm actually looking more for um, like uh, I guess a term would be gravel riding, which um, consists of riding uh, off pavement and mostly on like forest ser service roads or on a dirt trails and that's where the um off-road hand cycle uh kind of comes into comes into play let's see next question mm. if you'd never been injured what do you think your life would be like right now um that's a that's a deep question i guess um I tell people this all the time that uh, I think breaking my neck probably saved my life. Um, you know, growing up, I didn't really have any plans for anything after uh, 30 years old. Um, I was um, I was injured a month before my 21st birthday, and uh, I was uh, an active duty Marine at the time. I figured I would be doing, I mean, I had my mandatory four. I figured I'd probably re-enlist 
and um, do my uh, do my eight years because uh, I guess what a lot of people don't realize is when you when you join the military, typically what you do is you sign up for an eight year tour, and four of it is active, and then four of it is what they call um, inactive reserve. Um, I think there are some contracts where you do like a six by two, where you do six active to uh, inactive. Um, but I wanted to get my eight years um, out of the way. And, um, and then um, after that, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really make plans for after that. Um, I think a lot of it, I was, you know, pretty short sighted. And I think a lot of it was, um, there was just why, why worry about the future when I can live in the now? Um, before I joined the Marines, I was actually a heavy equipment mechanic um, for um, a Caterpillar dealership here uh, here in Oregon, and um, that was a that was a, that was a good job. Um, I liked um, I liked um, kind of the uh, uh, what would you say? Well, okay, so I was a um, I was a field mechanic. Um, so we um, we worked uh, we worked out of a truck, and we would just travel to different job sites. And um, you know, I like that. Um, I knew that you know when I graduated high school, I knew that um, an office setting wasn't going to be for me. Um, kind of that traditional nine to five cubicle life. I would have uh, just much rather just blown my brains out. Um, definitely um, not. And it's, it's 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 not for everyone. I think um, I think the people that do do it, um, I don't know how. Um, but uh, no, that was um, go, going out of high school. I. I I knew I wasn't going to work in an office and that's, that's why I went the, um, the mechanic route, um, joined the Marines, um, liked, um, liked working outside, liked working with my hands. Um, so let's say hypothetically or theoretically, whichever is the appropriate, um, nomenclature for that. Um, let's say I never got injured, did my eight years, got out. Um, I think, um, I would have um, I would have liked to use my GI Bill to go back to school and and find a job that I can um, that I could you know do both of those uh, work outside work with my hands um, and a couple like possible career fields that I w would have liked to look at or would have you know maybe been interested in would have been um, wildland firefighting. Um, or even like traditional firefighting. Um, I like the uh, I like the hours there. Um, National Park Ranger, uh, I think, would have been a kind of an interesting gig. And um, another one that I think um, that I actually just recently learned about was um, being a, a game warden for uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, Hmm. All right, the next few set of questions I filed under kind of miscellaneous. So they're going to be uh they're going to be kind of all over the place. Um first one. What do you think about co-ed boot camp? And the um the individual that asked this question, I'm going to assume is referring to military boot camp. And um you know, I've I've kind of gone back and forward about this, um, and I I really don't have a strong opinion. I'll, I guess I'll preface that, um, but you know, it might work. I know the the Marine Corps just did a um, I don't know if it was a trial run or they um, they just uh, they just graduated their first kind of co-ed. Um, a boot camp class uh, at uh, Paris Island, um, and from what I know and from what I've read, which is very limited, 
it was um it was a success um and i think um you know it might work um but i will say this is that i don't think that we should lower the standards at all and by that what i mean is when um when i was going through boot camp um there were two different uh physical fitness tests pfts for um males and females um the biggest the biggest difference was uh, um the males did pull-ups and the females did flex arm hang where they would have to i believe it was just that they had to keep their chin up over the bar for a certain amount of time which um I, I want to say they did that because just, you know, our, our muscle structure and our bone structures are just different. Um, and that's just the reality. Um, not saying one's easier than the other because I have tried doing the flex arm hang and, um, it's, it's not easy by any means, but either our pull-ups, um, I don't think you should, I don't know what's, I don't know. I guess this is kind of a sensitive issue. I got to kind of dance around. Um, but I don't think you should lower the standard for um, the military if you're going to, you know, do something co-ed. I think everything should be the same across the board. And if you make the cut, you make the cut. Um, and that goes for um, any additional selection process. You know, if we're talking um, sending females to ranger school or going through um bud selection for uh navy seals or marsoc or you know green berets or um you know recon or whatever um i think you should um keep the standard the same and um you know if the individual meets that meets that baseline standard then then whatever um I guess other issues that you'd have to deal with are logistical issues, um, you know, bathrooms, showers. Are you going to have co-ed showers like they do in uh, Starship Troopers? Is that going to be a distraction? I don't, I don't freaking know, you know. Um, but hey, you know, it it might work, it might not work. I guess we're just going to have to try it out and see what happens. Um, the, uh, the next question kind of relates to that. Um, and it is, why do people think we eat crayons? Uh, the person that wrote that question is a Marine and the running joke, or I guess kind of the most recent joke for me is that, uh, Marines are crayon eaters and, um, you know, I maybe heard that two or three times in my Marine career. Uh, it was more of a throwaway line, but the civilian population kind of got wind of it, thought it was funny, ran with it. So, yeah, I guess to answer that question, I think it's just kind of funny to call someone a crayon eater or a window licker or a mouth breather. Um, I don't take it personal, whatever. My favorite you know, flavor crayon is uh, blue because it tastes like sky. Moving on. Uh, next question. Could your injuries be treated with stem cells? I have a good, I have a friend with good tissue above and below his injury site. And his wife was telling me that if the surgery were legal, he could walk again. Um, possibly. I don't know enough about stem cells to um to really have a comment on that i'm definitely way too dumb i don't even know how stem cells work like do you eat it do you inject it do you uh, apply it as a topical i have no freaking clue but from um what i heard and i guess we'll just call this a uh, bro science um from what i've heard it looks promising and i don't understand why we aren't, um, you know, funding research for it. Um, 
But then again, you know, I don't really know much about the topic to uh, to, to really have a solid opinion. Next question. Um, what do you think you have a better perspective on in your professional versus personal life than you did before your life change? Uh, what's better now? And I hope I'm understanding this question right. Um, but I think the biggest change for me pre-injury and post-injury is patience. Um, you know, being in a wheelchair, I really had to learn on how to work on my patience. Um, and that was something that I, I kind of struggled with, um, kind of in, in the, uh, the early stages of, uh, of the injury especially coming from, you know, an up-tempo profession, um, such as, you know, being a Marine, where everything was bang, 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 go, 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 um, do this, do that, you know, speed and intensity. Um, so I really had to work on my patience. Um, I really had to work on my patience and my communication skills and making sure that, you know, I was able to, um, to direct the care that I needed and um, if it wasn't done in a timely manner, I, I really had to understand that, hey, you know, the person helping me is, they, they, got, they got their shit going on too. A lot of times, you know, if I snapped at a family member because they couldn't get me, um, couldn't get me, you know, a cup of water in time, I had to realize that, hey, they're, they're dealing with all of their other shit and I'm putting some of my shit on them. So I really had to work on my patience and um, my clear communication skills. Next question. Um, Would you ever get a dog or cat? Um, Well, right off the bat, I'll tell you, I will probably never own a cat. Um, They're just not for me. Never have owned a cat. Don't really see any reason why. I've, um, I've spent some time with some friends who have owned cats and I get it, I guess. I don't know. The only use or the only like reasonable use for a cat that I've seen personally was, um, I spent a summer in Florida with a good buddy and, uh, he had a cat and I actually fucking hated that thing because it pissed off everywhere so you know in i i didn't even have a like a guest room i was kind of just in a bed like in his office um so it was all there was no door it was all open and the fucking cat would always come in and piss on my bed so what i ended up having to do was i would have to create like a barrier so the cat wouldn't jump up on my bed and i would just go grab a couple bar stools place them on my bed um, every morning before I left the house. Uh, one good thing I will say about that cat was it would kill all the, uh, all the lizards and stuff around the house, which, I mean, if there's anything I hate more than cats, I think it would be reptiles. And, um, yeah, it would, uh, it would, you know, just eat all the lizards and shit. So I guess cats kind of do have one redeeming quality. Um, as for a dog, you know, I've, um, I've thought about it, um, kind of, um, if it was possible, uh, I, I, I do love dogs. Um, I think they're great. They're, um, man, they're, you know, man's best friend for a reason. Um, it's just for me right now in my, um, in my, at the, at this stage of life, uh, I'm just, I'm never home. And I would hate to put that burden like on my folks to um, to take care of a dog when uh, when I travel out of the country for, you know, weeks at a time. Um, but yeah, no, if, uh, if I ever um, if I ever decide to settle down, I think um, a dog or possible couple dogs, maybe three, four. I don't know. Maybe I'll start a fucking rescue. But yeah, no, it's uh, it's possible. Next question. Um, 
what is your favorite family holiday tradition? And uh, that's a, that's actually a really good question just because we're, um, we're kind of uh, at the brink of um, what you would call holiday season. We got um, Halloween coming up right around the corner. Uh, Thanksgiving is next month. And then uh, Christmas will be here um, before you know it. And I would say I think my favorite um, tradition is um, we, uh, we, we traditionally will host uh, Thanksgiving at, at my house. Um, and I think that's just because we, um, well, okay, I think that's because I think my mom is probably the best cook in the world. And, um, we have, um, we have kind of the, the perfect venue for it. There's, um, there's eight acres and, um, you know, the kids, if it's a nice day, they can go outside and run around. And, um, we have kind of a nice open living room area or as the, uh, HGTV, uh, house hunters, as they would call it, um, entertainment space, um, I remember, I think it was, it was the first year that I had moved to Alabama um, and my stepdad was um, out there with me. We weren't able to come back for Thanksgiving. I think I had a, a tournament and it was just too tight of a window for travel. So my mom flew out to spend Thanksgiving with us and so the rest of the family, and by family I mean... Um, you know, all the, uh, all the cousins, all the, um, nieces and nephews, grandparents, um, they kind of had to do Thanksgiving on their own. And the feedback that we got after that Thanksgiving was you guys are hosting Thanksgiving next year because it was a shit show. Um, one of the n newest things that we did this year was we had a, um, a summer camp out where we had, you know, the same folks that would normally come over for Thanksgiving, cousins, nieces, nephews, grandpas, grandparents. They, uh, they all came over and we did a little summer camp out where they would pitch a tent up in the backyard. And we had, um, we had a big barbecue. And then in the evening, once it got dark enough, we, uh, set up the projector outside and we watched a movie and we had a, um, uh, nice little bonfire and we, we made s'mores it was a good time. Um, it was, um, a little bit right after my birthday. And, um, I think, um, I think that's a tradition that I would like to, um, continue to do. It was, um, it was just, a, it was really, really fun. And I, I think the kids really enjoyed, you know, just coming out and, and camping in the backyard. Uh, next question is who is cooler, Ted or Sierra? And that question was submitted by Sierra, who is Ted's girlfriend. And who is Ted? Ted is my little brother. And to answer it, um, I can't really choose. I mean, both are equally cool. My, um, my brother, Ted, he, um, he moved a uh, little background. Um, Ted is uh, four years younger than me. Um, when I graduated high school, he was coming in, and um, he um, he's you know we we grew up um, in a single single mom family for the first half of uh, our um, childhood, and then um, you know Pat, my stepdad, came into the the picture. Um, but uh, me, me and Ted, we've um, maybe we didn't necessarily know it at the time, but we've been best friends um, all our lives. You know, he's um, without growing up without having a dad, he's he's kind of been the other the other guy in the house, and we've um, we've been through a lot together. To say, uh, he moved to Alabama with me briefly. Um, uh, the last year that I was um, in Birmingham, we've gone on countless road trips to uh, 
Illinois and back and forth between Alabama. Um, we used to go, uh, you know, back when I was an able body, we used to go on ski trips together. Um, and you know, like he's a, he's an interesting guy cause we're, um, we're similar in a lot of ways, but we're also different in a lot of ways. You know, he's kind of more of the, um, educated type, I would say. He's um, currently going to Portland State and finishing his uh, master's degree in computer science, something that I don't even know where to begin or how to describe. Um, And um, Sierra is his girlfriend. They've been dating for, I don't know now, like two years or so, something like that. And um, Sierra is... She's she's a pretty awesome gal. She's a little bit younger. Um, she just had a birthday. I think she's like 22 now or something. Um, which also means she's like also like just 16 in my eyes. But um, I think Sierra is pretty cool because she goes to the movies with me. Um, and she also kind of gives me like an insight on the younger generation because there's definitely a gap. As much as I don't like to admit it, I'm fucking pretty old. I'm definitely not as old as uh, some of my peers. But no, there is a there is a generational gap. So I think it's um it's kind of cool that I you know get an insight on um what the kids are doing nowadays and uh, what's cool and what's uh what's old fashioned. Um. So yeah, I guess to answer the question, uh, it's um. It's neutral. You guys are both equally cool. Next question. What or right. next question. Favorite South Park episode. Um, I had to think about this one because um, I think I've seen most, if not all, of the South Park. They uh, they used to be available on Netflix in the early days, and um, I would um, would definitely binge a lot of South Park. Um, but, um, I had to think about it. Um, I think my favorite one is called Butters Bottom Bitch. And it's basically the one where Butters becomes a pimp and he starts pimping out girls in his, uh, in his class to give kisses (laughs) or hugs. Um, but it was, a it was a hilarious episode. Um. Next question. Uh, what scares you most? Um, I guess, uh, what scares me most? Um, things with no legs or with too many legs, such as snakes or millipedes, centipedes. Um, those, uh, those things just really shouldn't exist. <laughs> um, but um, no, I guess maybe what really scares me the most is um, the um, is uh, is failing. Um, you know, just just going through life and looking back, and um, you know, I don't I don't want to. Um, I don't want to fail. I don't want to let anyone down. I um anything that I do, I want to try to do my best and I want to um I want to live up to my potential. Um and I think um I think that um that kind of uh lingering fear of failing has been kind of what drives me and what keeps me going. Um and um you know, I don't, I don't want to let anyone down. I don't want to, I don't want to anyone to look at me and say like, dude, you are a complete failure or you failed at this task. Um, with that being said though, um, I, um, I don't, I don't let failure define me because, um, I mean, if you, uh, if you know anything about me, you, you would know that I've, uh, I failed many times in my life. Um, but you, um, you gotta just learn the lesson 
Um, I guess I'll give an example. Um, last year was our first year with um, being an, an official um, sanctioned wheelchair rugby team with the uh, the Oscar Mike Militia. That was the uh, that was the first year that we were postseason eligible, and we had set a goal. Uh, at the beginning of the season, and that was to either win or compete for a Division II championship. And by that, I mean, you know, be in the championship game. And we failed that goal by losing in the crossover, which is the uh, the semifinal to get into the finals. Um, yeah, that was um, that was a, a definite failure, but. Um, you um you just gotta kind of reflect on the um on what what happened and and move on from there. But you also need to um, you need to um, you need to have an honest conversation with yourself and sit down and be like, okay, what went wrong? You know, do a um, do an assessment. Do a um, well, I guess what you would call a battle damage assessment and say, all right, this is, um, this is why we failed. And this is what we're going to do moving forward in the future to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Um, so yeah, that's really all I got to say about what scares me the most. Uh, next question. What is your favorite book? And that's kind of another broad question because I read a variety of books. Um, but the one that I always refer to when someone asks me this question is um, The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. Um, and if you're familiar or if you're not familiar with um, Ernest Hemingway or that particular novel, it's basically a book about uh, World War I veterans who decide to um, live in France after the war versus coming home, you know, becoming expats and um, living in, yeah, it is France. Um, but then they, uh, they end up traveling kind of around the region. They, um, they end up traveling to go to Spain to go, do some fishing and watch some bullfighting. But the um, kind of the themes that they touch in that book, I think are relatable for what, um, what the veterans are going through today when they come back from, uh, when they come back from um, Iraq or Afghanistan or, or even just in transition from active duty military life back to civilian life. Um, so I would, um, I would highly recommend anyone to check that out, especially if you're, um, if you're about to make that transition yourself. Um, it's a, it's a great book. It's not very long. It's Ernest Hemingway. So it's a, you know, very easy to read. Um, and it's just very well written. Um, and I actually just found this out. I, it's a, uh, it's a movie and a, I want to say it might have been made in like the 50s or 60s, but it's not available anywhere but VHS. So I need to figure out how to track that down. And then I also need to track down a VCR because we got rid of our VCR maybe like 10 years ago. I believe they don't even make them anymore. But um, if anyone has a lead on that movie or a VCR, hit me up. Next question. What embarrassing music is on your playlist? Um, I don't really have like a set playlist that I listen to. So I'm just going to say what embarrassing music is on my um, phone. And I would say it's the uh, all the cheesy love ballads. Um, when I travel, I'm, I'm primarily listening to audiobooks or uh, different podcasts that I follow. But uh, I do have some music. Um, 
And yeah, I'd say the most embarrassing or surprising uh, would be all the cheesy love ballads. I have, um, I got a little bit of air supply. I definitely have Unchained Melody on there. Um, there's a guy I just recently discovered, uh, Boyce Avenue, and he does like acoustic covers of um, different pop songs and whatnot. Um, but yeah, whatever. I mean, cheesy love ballads. Yeah, everybody needs to feel something sometime. And the last question that we have for today's Q&A, and I believe we're getting close. Uh, we're past the, uh, the one hour mark already. Um, the last question that we're going to have for this, uh, this episode is, will you be my date to the Oscar Mike ball? And the person that asked this is, uh, is referring to the, um, annual Oscar Mike anniversary ball that we do, um, in, um, middle of October. And that's just a, um, that's a, uh, a big banquet or ball that we do um, in Chicago as part of the uh, the Oscar Mike Foundation, and it's just a um, it's a celebration of another year of you know the foundation and uh, what we accomplished that year, and we'll have uh, we'll have guest speakers, and there'll be like you know a silent auction. Everybody dresses up. It's generally a really good time. Um, and this year I, um, I decided that, um, I'm going to be going solo, but, uh, I will save you a dance and you know who you are. Um, but yeah, no, I just, uh, I decided to go solo this year just cause, um, it's, uh, it's going to be kind of like one of those in between thing, in between events where. I got um going I'm I'm going to the beach next week and then I get home. I'm gonna be flying out to Chicago and then right after the ball I'm gonna be going out to Paraguay for um for I think ten days. We're gonna be out there doing a um a wheelchair rugby clinic with the um the uh, Paraguay national team. So yeah, just um, this year I just decided that I'm going solo. But if you want to call me your date, you can call me your date. I will definitely save you a dance. And uh, let's see, that's gonna wrap up the Q and A for this time. Um, like I said before the uh, the episode started, this is a uh, not something that I kind of had planned. Uh, it was kind of last minute. Just wanted to do a little Q and A. Um, so uh, if you um, if you enjoyed the episode and you uh, you got some questions that you want to ask, go ahead and fire them away. And what I'll do is I will just uh, put them into a Word document and save them. And if I ever have like an, oh shit, I need to put an episode out, I will refer to those questions. Um, you literally can ask me anything and I will uh, I'll do my best to answer them um, if... Uh, if I, um, I don't, you know, if, if I'm going to have an opinion or if I'm not an expert on the subject, I'll, I'll admit right away that I'm not an expert on the subject and I don't consider myself an expert on any subject, but I have a lot of experience in a variety of different things. So, I mean, go ahead and fire away. Ask me those questions. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, go ahead and give me a review or a rating on you know apple or google or spotify or facebook um i need to hear your feedback um if you hate the podcast i mean give me a negative rating but let me know what i can do to improve and um i think that's it that's all i got for this week um hopefully going to be recording some more episodes while i'm out in uh, chicago and um we'll um We'll start uh, kind of getting back to our uh, regular schedule program, um, starting with the next episode. But that's all I got for now. So uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll uh, catch you all next time. See ya.